In this topic, we'll be talking about biotechnology. We'll start by defining what biotechnology is. We'll talk about some more traditional applications of biotechnology going back, in some cases, thousands of years, and then finish up with some more modern applications. So biotechnology is simply, as this cartoon says, using organisms and their products to benefit humans. This is kind of the um, broadest definition of biotechnology, using organisms and their products to benefit humans. So here are some examples of biotechnology using that definition. One of them is the breeding of crops, the breeding of plants together to make more nutritious, more caloric um, containing crops. Also things like brewing beer, wine, um, having bees kept to produce honey, other things like making yogurt, um, milking cows, uh, vaccines, so all kinds of different things we use as examples of biotechnology. And so we're going to be comparing two different ways here. You can see circled in red that our crops, our plants, are genetically modified to benefit humans. One of those is through traditional breeding, where you cross plants together and choose which offspring, offspring we want to then continue to breed together and reproduce and so on. And then we'll talk about later what's called transgenics, where we take genes from specific organisms and put them into other organisms using what's called recombinant DNA methods. And we'll get into that. You can see there are other methods here that are um, used that we're not going to discuss, but there's benefits and pros and cons to um, each of these different methods. So traditional breeding makes use of the natural variation that exists amongst individuals or amongst um, organisms. And we use what's called artificial selection, see it over here, that's also called selective breeding. Selective breeding is a term that's more often used in animals, but anyway, they mean the same thing. And I said this is the process then where we choose which individuals we produce in order to promote specific traits. So for example here, we've got um, natural variation in this corn crop here, okay? And we only take the seeds from the biggest, juiciest uh, corn kernels, and we plant those. And then we take them and we breed them together with other ones and keep doing that over and over and over again. And eventually, you go from having this very poor, low nutrition um, crop to one that has a lot more nutritional value because we've bred them together over and over. Where here in this example here, you breed together um, a big fruit with a sweet fruit and keep doing that over and over again. And hopefully you end up with one that's got a big fruit that's also very sweet. And we've done that. All of our crops we get in our stores have gone through this process, in some cases for thousands of years. Here are some examples. So when you go to the store and you buy strawberries, you're buying domesticated strawberries, where we bred together strawberries to get their to have very small seeds and be very large berries. Here's actually a picture of a wild strawberry. Um, back at my parents' house in Minnesota, they have both domesticated strawberries that they planted, but also wild ones that were growing there naturally. Wild strawberries are super small, about the size of your pinky fingernail, and they have big seeds. Their taste is amazing, though. They're so much better than domesticated strawberries. Um, but because they're hard to pick, they don't travel well, you have to pick a lot of them to get the fruit, they have big seeds, um, they're not ideal for crops. So farmers bred them over and over and over again, and eventually we got these um, varieties that are kind of in modern day um, stores. Similarly, um, all these crops are vegetables here, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, broccoli, etc. They all are the same species actually. 
Um, they're all derived from this wild mustard plant, and they bred together different wild mustards and kept doing that until they got these different varieties that, again, over thousands of years have different characteristics. Similarly, all of our dog breeds are descendant from wolves, where we bred together wolves to begin with to get these different traits, and you can continue to breed to pr promote certain traits like shorter tails or a certain color fur or certain things like being very tall like a Great Dane or short like a Chihuahua, things like that. Here's another example. If you go to the store, the variety of banana that most of us um, consume in the United States is called the Cavendish variety. Uh, if you cut that open, sometimes in the center, you'll see like these three little dots kind of. That's the banana, you'll see like these three little dots. They're more like right in the center like this. And those are the seeds. The seeds, we've bred them to be so small, this variety cannot even reproduce by itself. It depends on humans now to propagate it, to continue that crop to be able to grow. Um, here's an example of a wild banana. You can see they're very small, about the size of somebody's hand. They have huge seeds. They're very pulpy. Not something you and I would probably want to eat, but that's where this one came from. By breeding these together over and over, you get really small seeds, fewer seeds, sweeter fruit, and um, easy to peel, etc. In animals, here's a couple examples. So remember that toddler doing the one-handed push-up in the previous um, lecture? Well, this cow here has the exact same mutation, causing them to produce muscle nonstop. If you are a beef cattle farmer, you're like, this is amazing. Look at all these good pieces of meat I got here. Um, this is great. I want to have this cow, this bull here, breed with a female and then hopefully pass that on to offspring. Similarly, here's our one of our kind of types of modern day pigs. You might think, well, how is that an example of artificial selection? Well, pigs are descendant from wild boars. Wild boars are very mean. A lot of times they've got big tusks that are sharp and um, dangerous. They're very aggressive. They have thick hides. Modern day pigs are very kind of sweet creatures, docile, um, very easy to, to handle, and they've been bred for that, those characteristics. Um, I think the last example here is with, with chickens. So the size of our chickens, or the size of chicken breasts particularly, has been bred for, um, especially with a certain variety of chickens called broiler chickens. And it's been really intense breeding over the last 50 or so years, to the case where um, in 1957, the same species of chicken started out, you know, 34 grams, here it starts out bigger when it's born. In 28 days, it was 316 grams. Here's the same size in 28 days, and then four times the size. So amazing changes in rate of growth um, because of breeding over and over. Unfortunately, this has negative consequences for these chickens. Um, their lungs can't keep up with this rapid growth rate, and so they have difficulty um, breathing and pulmonary problems achy joints. Um, they have a stressed heart because of, you know, again, too much work for this large of a body growing so fast, weak legs. Sometimes their breasts get so heavy, they fall forward and they can't get back up and they suffocate. So um, there's some real trade-offs to um, this type of approach um, where we've taken it to certain extremes in some cases. Now I want to talk about modern biotechnology. When I hear the word biotechnology, this is usually what I think of. What are these modern approaches to it? So one technology that I'm going to introduce here is called recombinant DNA technology. It sounds very confusing, but this word recombinant is just like recombine. So that's what it is. It's recombine DNA from two individuals. By directly All right, let me rewrite that word there. <laughs> by 
directly manipulating the DNA. So we take DNA from one organism and we put it into another one. Um, I should say it's two or more. It could be DNA from multiple individuals putting it into one. And this is a common technique used in genetic engineering, a term I'm sure you've probably all heard of. And it creates this recombinant DNA. This DNA is recombined from two or more organisms. So <clears throat> it's not always from different species. Sometimes it's from one of the same species to another organism of the same species. If it's done between different species, it creates what are called transgenic organisms made by artificially combining DNA from two or more species. Previously, if you wanted DNA from one species into the next, you had to combine them directly. For example, if you breed a horse and a donkey together, you can create a mule. But mules cannot reproduce. Mules are sterile. So the only way to get more mules is by breeding together more horses and donkeys. Similarly, if you want to if you breed together a tiger and a lion, you can get a liger, but ligers cannot reproduce. Uh, it's easier for plants to cross between that, that species border um, barrier, like you can make grapples, um, breeding together grapes and apples, and there's been a number of other examples of that. But for animals, it's a lot tougher for some reason to um, cross species in that way. <clears throat> this video here is going to introduce this process of recombinant DNA technology. Please do not get bogged down in the technical aspects of it. Just kind of look at the overall picture as how it's being done. A common technique in genetic engineering is to insert a new gene into a loop of bacterial DNA called a plasmid. The molecular tool used to cut DNA is a restriction enzyme such as ECOR1. The enzyme has a precise shape that allows it to run along the groove of the double helix scanning, in the case of ECOR1, for the base letter sequence G-A-A-T-T-C. The enzyme then cuts the plasmid at this specific point, allowing a new piece of DNA to be inserted. When it cuts, ECOR1 leaves a sticky end. This helps the new gene to attach. The joins are then stitched together by another enzyme called DNA ligase. The genetically engineered bacteria is grown in a culture medium. Very quickly, large numbers of the bacteria can be produced, each with a copy of the inserted gene. The bacteria duly manufacture whatever protein the gene codes for, and so the desired product is made. A common so let's take a closer look at this process of recombinant DNA technology. <clears throat> so as the video mentioned, you have these structures called plasmids. Plasmids are little circular pieces of DNA that are found in certain bacteria. And here we've got our gene, it could be a human gene, that we want to, to copy. And so we take this gene of interest and we insert it um, into this plasmid. So first of all, you isolate the gene of interest and you isolate the plasmids from those bacteria. They're done here. Then you cut both of them with a certain enzyme that acts as a scissors. You cut them with the same enzyme. That allows you then to attach those two together, to insert the piece of DNA, the gene of interest, into that plasmid. So you stitch those together, you use a special enzyme to put those together, <clears throat> then you take that recombinant plasmid. So right here, this is recombinant DNA. It's got DNA to two different organisms recombined together. You put that back into the bacteria. <clears throat> and then you grow those bacteria up and they produce this protein. So these are transgenic bacteria because here we have a gene from a different species going into this bacterium. And this is actually how insulin is produced nowadays. So anyone who's a diabetic who uses insulin, they're most likely having it made human insulin by bacteria. <clears throat> we'll talk more about that a little bit later. 
So here's a comparison between conventional breeding. This would be that um, artificial selection we talked about. Sorry, artificial um, selection, selective breeding. and then genetic engineering. So with this conventional breeding, you can see here, it's limited to exchange between the same or very closely related species. Like I said, it's hard to cross that species barrier, especially for um, animals. And you might not get the results you want. If you breed together two organisms, you don't always get the result that you want. And this can even be after many, many times of trying it, you might not get that gene for that muscle growth to pass on. Additionally, there can be other genes that you wouldn't want to have get passed on that come along with that. So undesirable genes can be passed along. And it can take a really long time, many, many generations of crossing to get the desired result results, if ever. Genetic engineering, on the other hand, allows for you to specify which gene or genes and you can put them from almost any different species into any other different species. There's very few, if any, limitations to crossing that species barrier using that direct manipulation of DNA. It can be done much faster. There are some downsides to it, though, in terms of the fact that um, by introducing genes into certain populations, depending on the gene, we can see cases of resistance to that develop, which can lead to... Um, problems with surrounding crops. There are concerns about um, allergies for humans. Let's say that you've got an allergy to peanuts. And normally you can eat corn just fine, but they took a peanut gene and they put it into corn. There's a possibility, however unlikely, that you could have an allergic reaction. Um, those are very rare and um, there really are very limited problems for human health related to genetic engineering of crops but there are some concerns for the environment that um, arise. Now, here's an example of genetic modification done to crops to protect them from pests. So this variety of corn called Bt corn, short for the gene from this bacterium, Bacillus thuringiensis, thuringiensis, Something like that. I don't know. And it's bacillus. Uh, means rod-shaped. Uh, thuringiensis, it seems like. And let's say you've got some corn plants. And normally you spray a whole bunch of pesticides on your field to kill the caterpillars here that are feeding on the leaves of your crops. Well, what if instead of spraying pesticides, you could put a gene in this corn that would produce something that would kill those caterpillars? And that's what they've done. They took a gene here from this bacterium that produces a substance that's toxic to the caterpillar. They put it into the corn genome, creating this recombinant DNA, this transgenic corn. And now what happens is it produces that toxic protein into the leaves only, so it doesn't affect the actual corn food part that we eat and, uh, or that cows would eat, and then those caterpillars die. The downside is, initially this did reduce, reduce the amount of pesticide, but these insects built up resistance, and so then you usually have to use pesticides again, and then you have problems now with more resistance, so it hasn't been the silver bullet that they expected it to be. Genetically modified crops are very widespread in the United States, especially for these top three crops. So I want you to know that for all three of these, there's over 80% of all of these crops are genetically modified in the US, corn, cotton, and soybeans. So massive amounts, it's widely adopted. Um, and again, there's a lot of controversy that surrounds this. If we had more time, you'd be able to talk about that. <clears throat> so I'd mentioned before how this recombinant DNA is made. And I talked about how it could be used to make human insulin, for example. So just going through this again, here we have a gene from the human um, pancreas cell that codes for the production of insulin. <clears throat> we cut out that gene, we isolate it. <clears throat> we isolate plasmids from DNA. We cut them both with the same enzyme and then put them together, creating this recombinant DNA. 
this plasmid now has the code for making human insulin inside of it. You put that back into the bacteria and then grow a whole bunch of them up. We extract that insulin protein, purify it, and then we sell it to diabetics. And that is how we get all the insulin nowadays that is being injected by diabetics through bacteria producing it. So how can bacteria produce a human protein? Well, that's because the genetic code is universal. Every organism on the planet, doesn't matter whether it's a plant, animal, bacteria, human, every organism uses the same four-letter genetic code. That letter is an A, T, G, C code. Those are the, the letters. We're not going to get into exactly what those stand for, um, but that's the code. And there's the different numbers of those that can repeat. You can have you know, C, 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 A, T, T, G, uh, G, etc. But using those four letters is a universal thing. So bacteria can make the same proteins that we do if we give them that code to produce. <clears throat> now I want to talk a little bit about this process called gene therapy. Gene therapy is replacing a missing or defective gene with a functional copy, a functional or normal copy, slash normal copy. And there's been some success with gene therapy, where we've taken organisms or individuals that have a very serious disorder, and we've replaced that missing or defective gene. The problem is, if you're doing gene therapy, you've got to replace the right gene, and you've got to put your replacement in the exact right spot. If it goes into the wrong spot, that can lead to serious problems. And in some cases, individuals have died from the gene going into the wrong spot leading to cancer. Um, and so gene therapy holds a lot of promise, but so far we haven't been able to really master it to the point where it's considered uh, or widely considered to be a safe um, procedure, some high risks associated with it. There's this technology that you may have heard about in the news called CRISPR. Um, we're not gonna get into exactly what that acronym stands for, what you should know is a tool for editing genes. It allows us to go in and manipulate genes on a very, very specific level, changing individual letters or cutting out very small parts of DNA very precisely. And so the way it works is you have this enzyme here called Cas9. You don't need to know that, but an enzyme that is going to actually cut the DNA. And then you have this guide RNA. RNA is another type of nucleic acid that's complementary to DNA, meaning it will attach to DNA or stick to it. And this guide RNA has a specific sequence that we can construct that matches whatever target we want it to stick to. And so um, those two things, the enzyme and the guide RNA, are going to come together, and they're going to seek out that specific part of the DNA. Once they find it, that sequence there is going to attach to the DNA, and then the Cas9, the enzyme, is going to do its job of cutting that DNA in that location. Now what you can do after that's been cut is you can either just remove that and let the DNA go back together, or you can make changes to those codes and then put it back together. So in theory, we could make changes to um, a baby's eye color if we knew all the genes involved, or to correct a genetic mistake. And so this opens up a whole kind of can of worms into what are the things that might be okay to change and what are the things that sort of cross that ethical line, you know? Are we okay with people um, making quote unquote designer babies saying, hey, I want my baby to have, you know, um, higher IQ than average or to have, you know, very defined calf muscles or to have better than normal vision, you know? Or are we saying that, okay, you can correct what we consider problems, but then where do you draw that line? It gets to be very complicated, um, and it's, it's kind of a little scary, at least in my my eyes, that we can do things nowadays that we haven't really thought out the ethical um, side of it as well as we could have. 
So you may have heard a while back about uh, a Chinese scientist who claimed to have um, modified the DNA of two twin girls to prevent them from being able to ever get uh, HIV. It was actually embryos, I should say, not girls, they're em uh, female embryos. And the way that they did that, or at least claimed to have done that, is by causing a mutation in this receptor. This receptor is called CCR5. It's a receptor that HIV uses to attach to the cells, and without that, it can't get in. And there's some people that naturally have a mutation where they don't have this, and they appear to be immune or resistant, at least, to HIV. So what the scientist claims to have done is to have induced a mutation so they don't produce this, um, this protein on the cells. And so the question is, was that ethical? Uh, well, we don't know. What other effects will that have on these individuals besides preventing HIV infection? Are there negative side effects it could have? Um, is it ethical to edit human embryos in a way like that before we even know if they're ever going to encounter HIV? Um, so again, complicated stuff. Um, some applications of it, though, that could be useful and used hopefully in the near future is that it could be used for individuals who currently have an HIV infection. And you could use that to modify the individual cells in a similar way so HIV cannot enter. So here, step one on the right hand side here, if I get my pointer, uh, HIV recognizes that receptor, uses it to enter the cell. Okay. Down here, the cells are making this receptor normally. Okay. But if instead we delete that part of the gene and they make a receptor that's incomplete, now that HIV can't get in. And so potentially you could prevent that person from having their HIV progress any further um, due to changing those cells if they've already been infected. Additionally, uh, HIV, when it comes in, it puts its uh, genetic material and integrates it into the genome, the genes of that cell, the DNA of that cell. And so you have to get that DNA out. Well, we could also do that. We could have... Um, a way to introduce this CRISPR system into the in infected cells, the ones that are infected with HIV, guide it to where that HIV sequence is in the genome, and cut that out, and then it like gets destroyed by the, by the cell to get rid of the um, HIV that's hiding in some of those cells, can lie dormant for decades. So that's another possible application for it. So again, a lot of promise with this, um, even though there could be some controversy. And the last thing we'll talk about with biotechnology is cloning. Cloning, in this application uh, of the word, is making a genetically identical copy of an organism. Down here, this QR code, if you scan it with your phone camera, will take you to a, a good um, review of this topic. But we'll go ahead and go through some highlights here. So why would you ever want to clone? Why would you want to copy an individual's genetics? Well, one reason is if you've got a certain trait, like that really muscular cow, that you want to guarantee that was passed on to offspring. The only way to guarantee it is by cloning that, because that will maintain the exact genetics from that uh, organism. Or let's say you've got a pet that died and you want that pet back, right? Well, you'll never get it back exactly the way it was, but you can get back a genetically identical copy of that pet. Whether or not it behaves in the same way as the same personality is a totally different thing because some of those things are genetic, but a lot of them are also environmental, um, and so there's going to be some differences most likely. So how is cloning done to copy an individual's genetic information? Well, first of all, what you need is you need an egg cell from some organism of that same species. And what you do then is you get rid of the DNA. You remove the nucleus from that egg cell. So you basically have uh, an empty egg cell, more or less. And then you take the cell from the organism you want to clone. So this is the one over here that we want 
to clone, to want to copy. Okay. And you take a cell. It doesn't have to be a memory cell, but it needs to be a, a younger cell. And then what you do is you combine those two together. The cell from uh, one of the body cells from the one you want to clone, an empty egg cell. It's kind of like fertilization, egg and sperm coming together to unite to make a single cell except for you're not having half the DNA in the egg and half in the sperm. Instead, you have no DNA in this empty egg cell, and then all the copies of DNA, because this mammary cell, in this case, is a body cell, um, from that one side. So you have to trick that cell into thinking fertilization happened. And scientists have been able to figure out how to do that, how to trick it into thinking it just got fertilized, which will then initiate cell division. It turns into an embryo. Then you take those embryos, and then just like in vitro fertilization, you put those embryos back up inside the uterus of whatever uh, organism's gonna carry that to term, and then it gives birth to a cloned sheep that's genetically identical to the original um, cell that was taken in this case from the mammary cells of the organism you wanted to clone.